Thank you, choir. Not so bad for just a pickup song, right? All right, this morning's scripture is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15a, and then Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And now Matthew, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, we are on to our next beatitude, beatitude number three. So, um, so far in our journey in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly the beatitudes, we've talked about how God, the whole sermon talks about how God is calling us to be light and salt for the earth. And, and Jesus starts the sermon by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, as I was preparing for today, I thought, I really like how Eugene Peterson writes the Beatitudes. Now, you, Eugene Peterson is behind the translation, The Message. So if you've ever read, you know, like the NIV or the RSV or the King James Version, there's The Message. And he writes it in such a way um, that it really is relevant to today. And so I, I liked how he wrote some of these Beatitudes um, that first one, blessed are the poor in spirit. He writes, blessed, you are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. <laughs> I like that. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. When we are poor in spirit, we find ourselves in this place where we realize we need God. And we find blessing in that place. And then for the next one, he writes, you're blessed when, you are, when you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you embrace, be embraced by the one most dear to you. In our grief, we find ourselves in a place where we can feel the love of God surround us. So today, we're going on to Beatitude number three, which is, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So let us pray. God, you are an awesome God, and we do come to this place to learn, to grow, to be inspired, to be your church, to get ready to go out and to serve as your church. As we come to this time of discerning what Scripture has for us, we ask that you open our hearts, that you open our minds and our spirits, that we can truly be present, knowing that you have 
something for us to think about, to consider, to ponder, maybe even to put in practice. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as I was preparing for today in Blessed Are the Meek, I was thinking about what, before I even went to study anything, what does meek mean to me? And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show my age. Um, the first thing that came to mind was Kenny Rogers' song, Coward of the County. <laughs> You know, that's the image that I had had in my brain when we talk about what it means to be meek. I mean, that's kind of the definition for today. And so um, there's also this story about a, a guy named J. Upton Dixon. Um, he was a fun-loving Christian fellow that was always joking around. And so he, he said once that he was going to write a book called Cower Power on this, this particular beatitude. And on top of that, he was going to, he, was, uh, he founded a group called Doormats, which stood for Dependent Organization of Really Meek and Timid Souls, if there's no, object, if there's no objections to that. Their motto was, the meek shall inherit the, the earth, if that's okay with everybody. And their symbol or mascot was the yellow traffic light. Caution, yes. So Dixon's humor really, um, I think, encompassed this view uh, of far too many people of what it means to be meek. For, for too many, to be meek is to be the coward of the county. It's to be the doormat of society. It's to be taken advantage of, to be used and abused and even cast aside. And to do that with a smile on your face. Part of the problem is also our current definition of the word. So after I thought about what it means um, when I hear the word, I, I thought about what does Webster say. And so I went to the dictionary. I went to a couple of dictionaries, and it was defined, meek was defined as quiet and gentle. Okay, I can get that. I get that. I'm okay with that. But then it goes on to say, easily imposed on and submissive. It sounds like a lot like allowing people to take advantage of you and just go with the flow and do whatever. And as I thought about that, I thought, I'm not on board with that. Nowhere in the gospel um, do we see Jesus doing that. Jesus isn't um, easily imposed upon. He is not submissive, at least not to in, in our worldly view. Um, Jesus didn't allow others to impose their will upon him. Um, he kind of, that's kind of what got him in trouble in the end. Um, religious leaders wanted him to stop. They wanted him to stop teaching. They wanted him to stop preaching. They wanted him to stop, you know, hanging out with all those people that he was hanging out with. But in the end, they didn't really impose their will upon him because Jesus didn't stop. So then I went on to Webster's definition, the Webster Dictionary, and it got worse for me because Webster defined it as enduring injury and patience with patience and without resentment. Now, I will say that Jesus did do that at the very end when he went to the cross. He endured injury with patience and without resentment, um, but there were times that he wasn't very patient, was he? I mean, if we go to Matthew 21, we read Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Does not sound submissive to me. 
Now, according to Webster's 21st understand, century understanding of what it means to be meek, Jesus didn't sound too meek to me. Didn't sound very submissive to me. Webster went on to say that meek means to be deficient in spirit and courage. Jesus was definitely not deficient in either one of these things. He was very courageous. He stood up to the religious elite. He stood up for social justice. He stood up for the outcasts, the outsiders. He condemned an impressive system that was, was hurting the most vulnerable in society. He reached out to the rejected. He does not sound like he was sub, uh, deficient in spirit or courage. It took courage to do all of those things. So I'm thinking that our current understanding of the word meek gets in our way of understanding what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So instead of going to our secular understandings of what the word meant, I went to biblical scholars to see what they had to say. And Regent University defined the biblical understanding of meekness as essentially an attitude or quality of heart whereby a person is willing to accept and submit without resistance to the will and desire of someone else, and in the case of Christians, that someone else is God. To be meek in a biblical sense is to be ready and willing to submit to the will of God. Greek scholar Henry Thayer said the Greek word for meek referred to a disposition of spirit in which we accept God's dealing with us as good and therefore without disputing or resisting. He went on to say that it also means to be gentle in spirit. So to be meek means that we're trusting God, that we're going where God is calling us, even though maybe in our heads it doesn't make sense. We're going to trust God. We're going to live like God calls us to live. And we're going to be gentle in spirit. Gentle in spirit. In Greek literature, that word for gentle in spirit that we find here to us helps us understand what Jesus meant when he said blessed are the meek or blessed are the gentle. Xenophon a scholar from forever ago said the, the used the word to describe I love this. A wild horse that was being broken. To be tamed, Not broken, tamed. He said a wild horse that had been tamed, but whose spirit had not been broken. The horse was still lively and vigorous and energetic, but under the control of the master and therefore useful. Then we have Plato. In his writing, in writing... Uh, of a victorious general who spared a conquering people, he spoke of him as being meek. There was a general who had won, and instead of doing what all the other generals did and just wiping out all of the people, he let them live. He let them thrive. It took strength in character. It took kindness and compassion, and Plato said he was meek. Socrates said that, that a gentle person or a meek person was one that could argue his case without losing his temper. 
Aristotle used the same word to depict someone who was upset at social injustice, but who didn't allow his anger to move into revenge, vindictiveness, or retaliation. Does that give us a clearer understanding of what this word meek means? When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the gentle, the, the humble, the one that's not going, not a doormat, but the one that's not going to allow their emotions or their feelings to cause damage, whether it be to relationships or to society as a whole. It's not about allowing others to dictate your life or being submissive to the demands of others. It's about allowing God to dictate where we go in life, being submissive to God's call on our lives. This is about a, a profound strength that we have that is under control like that horse it's the passionate person's unwavering in her conviction, yet kind, compassionate, humble, and even patient, submitting to God's will. Now, I think the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote our passage from Colossians, and I think the Apostle Paul really learned this lesson because, as we talked about last week, Paul started out by persecuting Christians, by doing some really horrific things. He had that three-year hiatus where he had to get his act together. But before becoming a follower of Christ, he was anything but meek or Gentile. Gentle, yeah, sorry. He was about uh, rounding up Christians. He was about killing them because he felt threatened by what they believed. He was threatened by, by this new understanding of who God was. How often are we threatened by other people's beliefs? Paul was threatened by these beliefs, and his response was retaliation. It was violence. And then he had this encounter with Christ. And he began to change. His spirit began to change. The anger and that need to be in control of everything began to change. And that is evident when he wrote this letter to the church, the Colossians. And he said to them, Close your, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Our world needs a little gentleness, doesn't it? Maybe our world needs a lot of gentleness. We live in a very polarized society. Um, we live in a society of someone doesn't think or believe the same way we do, our initial response is to attack, to be angry, to scream and yell and call names. None of you people, right? <laughs> Except for driving, I heard that. <laughs> Except for driving. But social media and, and, and the internet and all of that has just made it so easy for that to happen. Jesus knew that the world needed gentleness and that gentleness was actually strength that is under control. It's the passionate person unwavering in his conviction yet responding to every situation with gentleness, with kindness, with compassion, with grace. How different would our world be if we began to deal with each other with gentleness and kindness? Somewhere along the line, we, we decided as Christians, as a whole, not as you as individuals, but as a whole, that our job was to fix people. I know that the first time I said that my job as a pastor isn't to fix anybody, 
Somebody came up to me appalled. What do you mean your job's not to fix people? My job's not to fix people. That's God's job. God's job's to fix people. My job's to introduce people to the love of God. My job's to teach kindness, to teach compassion, to teach those things that Jesus taught us. That's my job. My job is to walk alongside of people. Not to judge, not to try to fix, not to condemn. And all too often, we as the church, we do that. Is it working? I don't think it's working. And not only is it not working, it's not what Jesus did. One of my favorite Jesus stories is when he's there with the the adulterous woman, the one that all of the religious leaders are ready, stones in hand to condemn. And this response was he who is without sin gets to cast the first stone. And after they all leave, he looks up to her and he says, is there no one left to condemn you? And when she says no, his response is, I am not here to condemn you either. Unfortunately, we as the church, we skip to the next verse, and we hold that one like a club where it says, go and sin no more. Well, go and sin no more means a whole different thing when it comes behind, I'm not here to condemn you. It's not a club It's a plea to live your life a little differently. We are called to gentleness. Paul addresses that in Galatians 6. He says, brother, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Because isn't that what Jesus did with the woman? It was with gentleness and compassion and grace. We're called to use gentleness and kindness when dealing with conflict. Proverbs 15.1 states that, that book of wisdom, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh one stirs up anger. Our world needs a little more gentleness and kindness when dealing with conflict. And man, it can be done. I have a friend, I've had a couple of people comment on our conversation on Facebook this last week. Um, not comment on Facebook, but talk to me about it. My friend Paul. Now, Paul uh, was Baptist pastor. Paul is actually the person I got Daisy May from, my dog. So I met him in Springport. He's a Baptist pastor, and Paul and I are about as opposite as you can get on everything. <laughs> Very seldom do Paul and I agree on anything. So every once in a while I'll post something and Paul will make a comment. And this last week I posted um, how the Bible, you know, it's not as cut and clear as we always think it is because, you know, the Bible says that Moabites are bad, but then we have Ruth, the Moabite. The Bible says that all people from us are bad, but then we have Job. Samaritans are bad, but then we have this beautiful story. And um, Paul made a comment about sin and how you need to call that out and sin is sin and and um, you know most I know where Paul's at and my response to him is Paul I know that we're going to disagree on what this looks like we disagree more often than not when Paul posts something that I don't agree with I will just simply say I disagree with you on that Paul Every once in a while, we'll agree on something, and it'll shock the daylights out of them. But here we are on polar opposites, and we treat each other with kindness, with grace. We know that we don't agree. I don't try to change Paul's mind. Paul doesn't try to change my mind. We listen to one another. Blessed are the meek. Being gentle in spirit is about emulating Christ. Jesus said, uh, or was described in, in Matthew 11, he was described as gentle and humble in heart. 
He wasn't a doormat. I mean, he was face to face with those religious leaders all of the time, disagreeing with them. But he was gentle and humble in heart. There is one more piece on this that I, that I want to touch on. I touched on what it means to be meek. What does it mean to inherit the earth? Well, it means that those who develop a meek spirit, a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of humility, will begin to view the world differently. It won't be about power. It won't be about material goods. It won't be about all those things that the world tells us are important. Instead, inheriting the earth means that we realize that we can create God's kingdom here. That God's kingdom can be our kingdom. When we live into that gentleness, we allow God to change our understanding of what's important. When we live into that gentleness, we begin to witness the kingdom of God growing all around us because we begin to see God in the faces of those we meet. They shall inherit the earth because they begin to see what's most important. Blessed are the meek. Let us pray. God of us all, we do thank you for the reminder that we are called to be gentle and kind and compassionate with de when dealing with one another. In a world full of anger and hate and hostility, your children are supposed to emulate Christ. We're supposed to be a Christ-like spirit. We're supposed to be meek and Gentile and kind. Help us as we go from this place to work on that, even when we're in our car. <laughs>